AMD's F-Series of locomotives, what proved to be the company's most successful locomotive series up until that point. Success in the market, however, would come to a sudden screeching halt as the early 50s moved into the mid-50s. The culprit for this sudden lack of success was highly ironic and highly unlikely. General Motors' EMD, or Electromotive Division, was formed in the early 1930s with the acquisition of a diesel engine producer called the Winton Company, who had a wide product category ranging from everything from stationary applications to marine applications and, of course, diesel engines for locomotives, better known as prime movers. This company would eventually be renamed by EMD to its Cleveland Diesel Engine Division, followed shortly thereafter by the acquisition of what was then known as the EMC or Electromotive Company, after which GM would then rename this division EMD, short for Electromotive Division. The company would actually be set up initially to look for mobile applications for diesel engines, to which GM could dominate his new markets. In 1933, after seeing EMC's, now EMD Division's, success with providing propulsion units for the original Burlington Northern Zephyr, as well as the M10,000, the company would essentially dive headfirst into the production of diesel locomotives for the domestic U.S. market, most notably the more successful 600-horsepower engine that propelled the Zephyr, specifically a Winton 201A two-stroke, eight-cylinder prime mover equipped with a roots blower as well as fuel injection, which allowed the Zephyr to reach speeds of an excess of 100 miles per hour along its route, plus the uniquely comfortable accommodations these trains offered compared to the old-style heavyweight coaches and steam-propelled trains of the time, cause a sudden and massive demand to develop for these new ways of traveling by rail, causing the Pullman Standard Company who had been involved with the M10,000 and the Bud Company who had been involved with the original Zephyr to enter into major contracts with EMD for the production of more of these streamliners. The end result of this was the construction of a new locomotive plant in McCook, Illinois, and the company's first type standalone locomotive in 1935, referred to as the BB. Essentially, this was a prototype range of models which only encompassed five locomotives was being produced, with the bodies for the earliest examples being subcontracted out to the St. Louis Car Company. Like many early production diesel locomotives, these were not streamlined units, but rather box cab type locomotives. Essentially, they were little more than oversized box cars that were self-propelled. These units would utilize two 12-cylinder 201A Winton power plants, making 900 horsepower apiece for a total of 1,800 horsepower. This model would be followed up upon by EMC, as it was still known at this time, by a model called the T. A. Only six of these, again, prototype locomotives were built by EMC, again powered by a 12-cylinder Winton 201 prime mover. With the success of these prototype-slash-demonstrator units, this in turn would lead GM to develop its first streamlined, standalone road locomotive produced in-house at its new plant, called the EA-slash-B model, as it produced both a cab unit as well as a cabless booster unit. These massive six-axle behemoths produced 1,800 horsepower, once again utilizing two 201A Winton Prime movers to make this horsepower, but were developed largely as a passenger-hauling locomotive designed specifically to haul the new standalone streamlined coaches being built by the Bud as well as Pullman Standard Companies. It would be followed shortly thereafter by the very similar styled E1 unit as well as the E2. Most notable on the E2 was that this is one of the first locomotives to utilize EMD's newly developed 567 prime mover. The company would make its way through the models E3, E4, E5, and E6 until it finally would reach something resembling mass production of these engines, each time improving them. Most notably, the introduction of the 567 Prime Mover, which would occur on the E2. It would, however, take until after World War II was done and the introduction of the E7 for this model to finally reach anything resembling mass production in 1945. In keeping with the way U.S. railroads traditionally ran trains, essentially having two type road locomotives, one for passengers, one for freight, and a separate type locomotive for Handle switching jobs, as well as locals called a switcher. To satisfy these demands, EMD would start production of switcher models, most notably its NW series, which would come out around this time. And, once again, this model, like its other models, would all be mass-produced to keep costs down, as well as to allow the company to fill massive orders in very short time frames. And thus we come to the actual piece of the puzzle in which this documentary is centering around EMD's F-series of locomotives. The first in this particular series of locomotives would be the FT. 
introduced in 1939. Now, one could certainly be forgiven for thinking that the F stood for freight models, much like Alco's later to be introduced Alco FAs, which had come out after World War II. But EMD's utilization of the naming convention is completely different. In this case, the F and FT stood for 1400 horsepower, spelled out verbally, although the actual horsepower of one of these units would be 1350 horsepower. While the T stood for twin, as these units were mainly planned to be sold as dual units, with an A plus a B unit sold as a set. Although many railroads would start operating them separately from their included sets to improve flexibility. And there were a few cases of A and B units being sold separately and not as sets. In contrast to the earlier introduced E units, the FTs were four axle units, designed again for freight service. Meaning they were geared for lower speeds to in turn provide better performance for dragging long freight hauls at lower speeds and lack steam generators to eat the passenger cars, something that was still required and would be required up until sometime in the 70s. These locomotives retain a similar shape to the E units, showing that they are definitely related, although somewhat scaled down, as in sharp contrast to the gargantuan length of EMD's own E units, which would reach an excess of 70 feet in length. The FT units were only roughly 50 feet in length, featuring what would become GM's trademark streamlined nose, similar to what could be found on GM's E series of locomotives, although in this case, with a much steeper rake at the end to accommodate the smaller chassis this locomotive was based upon, four axles instead of six, than the early E units which were being produced at the time, and the whole body, much like the nose, being generally shortened, much like Alco would do later with the introduction of its Alco PA and FA models. In terms of spotting features, this particular locomotive is hard to distinguish from its brethren. The main distinguishing factor that sticks out like a sore thumb on this locomotive, in addition to its unique for the F-Series locomotive's number of boards located on the nose, are the four closely linked porthole windows located on either side of the locomotive. It should be noted that even these distinctions are not reliable, as several railroads modified their engines over time. If an engine were to, say, get wrecked in an accident and require parts, and the company was able to recover used parts from a newer type, Type locomotive, it would simply swap these parts in, thus changing the profile of the engine. They were also one of the first type locomotives introduced with EMD's new 16 cylinder 567 prime mover, again making 1350 horsepower per unit. The F2 would have another enhancement as it would be one of the first engines produced in the United States that had dynamic brakes, a system in which the traction motors which would often be used to propel the locomotive could instead be used to slow the locomotive by simply reversing the polarity of current traveling toward them from the generator. This would also be the first mass produced road locomotive for the general with 555 AU units and 551 B units being produced. While these initial production numbers certainly were impressive for the time, there were other factors at work for the general, mainly luck. World War II would start not long after this locomotive's introduction onto the market. The War Production Board would essentially take control of all U.S. domestic production, targeting everything toward the war effort and rationing things such as rubber and gasoline, so these critically needed commodities could be kept strictly available for the war effort. To this end, the War Production Board strongly favored steam steam locomotive production over diesel locomotives. The reason being was very simple. Steam engines could run on coal, which wasn't a direct need for the war effort. Steam engines also lacked the requirement for sophisticated electronics, of the time at least, to keep the diesel engines running correctly, all of which caused any of the manufacturers that were also getting into diesel locomotive production, such as Alco and Baldwin, to be forced into producing steam engines as well as other products such as tanks for the war effort. This is certainly an understandable decision considering that these products suit the war effort best for these companies. General Motors, on the other hand, had never produced steam engines before and also had pioneered the mass production of diesel locomotives. As such, the War Production Board decided to take advantage of this and assured that GM would get all of the production orders for diesel locomotives, with the exception of some switcher models, which would be contracted out to Alco and Baldwin, in addition to other items such as aircraft and tanks. All of these contracts put together, specifically the one that gave GM the exclusive right to produce diesel locomotives to the war effort, which would lead the EMDFT to have a very impressive production run from March of 1939 to November of 1945. Side note, Alco would actually break this record with its Alco RS1 years later. This, in turn, 
turn gave the general a huge advantage once the war came to an end, as unlike its competitors, it would continue to be able to invest in developing its 567 prime mover for the war effort, and would thus be able to produce much better products once the war came to an end, unlike its competitors who would be forced to basically keep things stagnant for the time being, and thus be left several steps behind General Motors in terms of diesel locomotive development once the war came to an end. This would play a critical role in GM's ability to dominate the market once the war did finally come to a close. This would also lead to companies like Alco taking serious chances to push new, more sophisticated prime movers and those such diesel electronics out before they were ready at the end of the war, causing them serious issues. Feel free to check out my videos on this subject as I've covered it on several engines, including the RS3 and the Alco PA. Speaking of the end of World War II, much like its cars, EMD decided to get back into domestic production with essentially a slightly tweaked version of the FT referred to as the F2. In addition to being ready in terms of the technology it would place inside this locomotive, EMD was also ready in terms of its production capacity, as by this point EMD had opened yet another assembly line in LaGrange, Illinois. Visually not much distinguishes the F2 from the actual FT locomotives that had succeeded, mainly the side panels which featured portholes that were spaced out more, and the roof-mounted exhaust fans. Instead of being clustered on either end of the unit with two and two configurations, in this case they were clustered in the center of the locomotive itself. While the 567 had now been upgraded to the B variant, it still maintained its 1350 horsepower. The most notable upgrade to these units came with a D14 three-phase generator, allowing for better reliability and more flexibility. This would become a standard in all future GM products. These locomotives also featured EMD's new heavy-duty D27 traction motors with heavy-duty cabling for extreme reliability, especially when under heavy strains such as long trains up steep grades. Although these traction motors were still easily outperformed by the ones GE was placing in Alco's road units at the time. Another unique feature about this unit was the fact it was utilized for passenger service. Many railroads found that the more compact F units were easier to deal with in terms of dragging heavy passenger trains than the gargantuan E units the General had made bespoke for passenger haulage. The main advantage being redundancy, as if one locomotive failed in a multiple locomotive set with smaller locomotives, as opposed to fewer and larger locomotives, the remaining locomotives could drag the train to the next station, thus reducing or even avoiding delays. It was not uncommon to find these engines pulling passenger trains even if they weren't equipped with steam generators. Of course, this specific circumstance was limited to short trips and or short hops between stations. Railroads could always, of course, hook up one of these locomotives to a steam generator equipped B unit or perhaps one of Alco's FPB type units to get around the lack of a steam generator as an option. Unlike its predecessor the FT, these locomotives could be bought as dual AB sets or singular A or B units, with a total of 74 A units and 30 B units sold. A good reason for the lack of sales in this unit may have had to do with its limited production run, as the locomotive was introduced in July of 1945 and was out of production by November of 1946. On a sad note, none of the F2 survive, all were scrapped. The F2 would quickly be succeeded by the F3, which would be introduced in July of 1945, just shortly after the F2 had entered into production, and last in production until January of 1949. This engine would prove a notable step forward from the FT model, with the new variant of the 16-cylinder 567B model upgraded to produce 1500 horsepower, utilizing a roots blower and two-cycle combustion, as well as a notable increase in displacement and the usual fuel injection. These units were also updated to the new Blomberg type B trucks, an evolution of the original Blomberg design. Production numbers for this particular locomotive were highly impressive, with 1,111 A units and 696 B units being produced. These massive numbers played well to EMD's strengths in mass production, allowing them to produce the engines quicker, cheaper, and with higher quality than its competitors. Identifiers for this model were very minute, such as the side panels which was described as having a chicken wire type vent that ran the length of the entire side panel, and a specific roof on the earlier variations that was flat. Whatever the case, most of these details are moot as many owners of these particular locomotives would rebuild them and modify them over time with parts from again scrapped or wrecked locomotives of this type simply because there were simply so many of them around and parts were very plentiful and inexpensive used. Also, as many railroads would find it be inexpensive to upgrade these engines to more modern standards as the parts were so similar, this would in turn sometimes necessitate external parts of the locomotive to be modified to accommodate these upgrades grades.
The next model in GM's F-Unit lineage is the F7. It was put into production in February of 1949 and exited production in December of 1953. 2,393 A units and 1,463 B units were sold. Externally, the F7 is identical to the F3. The differences and enhancements between the two models lay inside the units. The differences in this particular model were largely to the electrical equipment on board, which allowed this locomotive to have a notable improvement in terms of traction effort roughly 20% over its predecessor, the F3, despite it being equipped with the exact same 16-cylinder 567 two-stroke prime mover its predecessor had, and at the same time making 1,500 horsepower, with the aid of a roots blower, again just like the F2 had. The notable sales of this engine were helped along by Alco's troublesome 244 prime mover, which caused its competing FA models to struggle against these locomotives in the market. The situation was made worse for Alco by GM's ability to push massive orders out very quickly. Thanks to its automobile-like assembly system it utilized to assemble its locomotives at its plants. While the F7 was definitely marketed by GM and mostly utilized as a freight locomotive, much like they had done with the previous F3 units, some railroads utilized it to pull passenger trains. A good example was on the Santa Fe, pulling its famous streamliners like the Super Chief and the El Capitan. While it was true that EMD would equip the previous models such as the F3, F7, and their future models such as the F9 with steam generators for passenger service, these units suffered from the fact that their boilers were extremely small due to the lack of space for a massive water tank that would be required for a long haul, and thus these locomotives were limited to short jaunts. The bespoke passenger variant of the F-Series of locomotives, such as the FP-7, would get around this by physically increasing the length of its actual frame four feet allowing for a bigger boiler to be installed and thus increase the locomotive's ability to supply heat for passenger cars over long trips. Despite the fact that these locomotives were also geared for passenger service and mainly designed for that service, they could also be utilized for freight service. They were essentially one of the first dual-mode locomotives to be placed on the market. However, a new type of locomotive was inspiring a whole new segment of the market in the U.S. and would eventually dominate all of it, called the Road Switcher. And after a few initial flops, EMD would eventually join this market with its GP7 in 1949. This would cause the F units to fall out of favor for freight operations that were not run-throughs and required switching jobs, as there was no place for the conductor to stand on the locomotive to facilitate the switching moves, something the new GP7 model had. This would be further aggravated by forthcoming FRA regulations that required that all locomotives not utilize footboards on the pilots, which was a small piece of extended metal in which the crew would stand on to facilitate switching as it was considered a safety issue. Therefore, any locomotive that would engage in switching operations had to provide some kind of staircase for the crew member usually the conductor, to stand on to facilitate the switching operations. This and a sudden lack of demand for the F units would cause them to start to fall off in terms of sales. The next model in EMD's F series of locomotives was the F9. Production for this model began in May of 1953 and would continue until May of 1960. These locomotives featured the updated 567C prime mover making a whopping 1750 horsepower. The same as could be found in GM's own GP9 product, which itself was an evolution of the highly successful GP7 road switcher that was essentially competing with this locomotive for sales, as these were more flexible locomotives that could do both freight as well as switching operations. Other than the new 567C Prime Mover, there was nothing really to differentiate the F9 from the previous F7 models. The only thing visually setting the earlier production models of this apart from later production F7 models was the addition of an extra vent in front of the front porthole of the locomotive on the side panel. Sales were limited to 101 A units and 156 B units. Again, this was an end result of the road switcher being discovered as a much more flexible alternative to full-on cab unit type road locomotives especially in the face of falling passenger patronage and revenues. This is in addition to new regulations that would make these locomotives far less attractive on runs that required switch jobs to be done on the way to the train's final destination, and would only make them useful in terms of doing through freights. The next model in EMD's F-Unit series was the FP9, seemingly an indicator of the downturn in passenger service. Introduced in February of 1954 and lasting until December of 1959, 90 of these units were built. Again, much like its direct predecessor, the FP-7, the FP-9s were 55 and a half inches in length, about four feet longer than a standard unit to accommodate the larger boiler for long-distance passenger service. 
but the reason for the lack of sales had to do with the ever reduction in demand for passenger service in the United States. There were simply no railroads buying passenger engines at this point because there was no demand for them. Airlines, as well as bus lines, as well as the average consumer owned automobile, now made an even more potent weapon against the railroads as it could now be put on long trips thanks to the interstate highway system with great ease. This, coupled with a drastic increase in labor rates, made passenger trains highly unprofitable, further reducing the demand for passenger-type locomotives. Another factor again was the road switcher engine, which by this point EMD had introduced in the form of its GP7 model, which could also be equipped with steam generators and even re-geared for passenger service, making it a more practical option for many of the smaller railroads and or railroads in general as expenses continued to climb to run passenger trains. The final nail in the coffin for the Freight F units came in the guise of EMD's own GP9, which was introduced back in 1954 and would increase sales throughout its life until production ceased in 1963, which sold 4,092 units, more sales than any of the F-unit models. The final model in EMD's series of F-units was the FL9. Only 60 of these passenger-type locomotives were produced between October of 1956 and November of 1960. This model was a special order by the New Haven Railroad designed to work both on its internal diesel prime mover as well as off of electricity picked up on either a third rail and at one point an overhead catenary, with the use of a specially designed pantograph which was quickly removed due to maintenance issues. These engines are distinguished from the standard F units in that they featured a two-axle front truck and a three-axle rear truck. Also, they were longer, even longer than the standard FP-style locomotive at 60 feet. And, needless to say, to permit third rail operations, they were also equipped with pickup shoes on their trucks. They were specifically ordered to operate a line from Woodlawn, Massachusetts to New Haven, Connecticut, which would require a dual-service locomotive as the electrification did not extend all the way to Boston despite early plans. Instead, the electrified territory ended just outside of New Haven, Connecticut. J.P. Morgan planned to have the New Haven's mainline electrified all the way to Boston, Massachusetts. Unfortunately, due to the declining fortunes of the railroad even back in these early days, this never took place and the electrification stopped in New Haven, Connecticut requiring all trains proceeding on to Boston, Massachusetts to switch to steam power, a time-consuming process that would increase the travel time for trains traveling to and from Boston, Massachusetts. It would take roughly 50 years with this project finally being completed by Amtrak in 1999 with the completion of the electrification of this line all the way to Boston for its Acela service. The FL9 would therefore be introduced to allow trains to run straight from New Haven to Boston, Massachusetts without having to change locomotives. The New Haven had actually planned to order up to 100 of these units, but unfortunately their declining fortunes by this point in time in the 1960s meant that the company could no longer afford these orders. They would continue doggedly in this service after the Penn Central bought the bankrupt New Haven and then itself went bankrupt, and finally, once that railroad itself went kaput, would find themselves in service on the Metro North as well as Amtrak. After undergoing rebuilds and being equipped with HEP power for the modern coaches, running on the Metro North between New York, Croton Harmon, and Poughkeepsie, as well as on the Hudson Division on Amtrak all the way up to Albany Rensselaer, as well as in services to the New Haven, Connecticut area that were not electrified, and of course the Harlem Line, which had in more recent times been re-established for the Connecticut Department of Transportation. They would continue these services doggedly until the mid-90s for Amtrak, and to the early 2000s with Metro North, until about 2010 for the Connecticut Department of Transportation, mainly seeing service on the Harlem Line. But the story of the FL9 doesn't end here. Many of them wound up on tourist railroads. A good example is on the Morristown and Erie, where two of the former Amtrak units were acquired by the railroad and eventually placed on their main eastern operation, now a fallen flag. But because these locomotives had declined in the market simply came from a better mousetrap being invented in the form of the road switcher locomotive that could do all the jobs that this type of locomotive could much more effectively and as a bonus could run locals as well as function as a switcher engine. Many railroads would actually trade their F units in on GP7 and 9 models as these would prove much more flexible for their needs, especially in the face of ever-increasing labor and expenses 
that railroads would continue to face as the 60s turned into the 70s. While GM was going through a period of planned obsolescence where it would design its products specifically to fail after a certain amount of years so that railroads would be forced to buy more locomotives and consumers more cars for the same period of time, thus generating it more money. However, despite the company's deliberate efforts to make these locomotives less reliable in the long run and thus force railroads to purchase more locomotives, Indy's locomotives proved very easy to rebuild due to the amount of parts around and the amount of companies specializing in replacing parts for these engines. This is ironically enough due mainly to the fact that EMD had managed to sell so many of them and the fact that many of GM's locomotives at the time shared the same common parts, including their prime movers, which also made upgrading these locomotives very easy as well, thus making it easy for second-hand dealers and companies alike to get excellent prices on second-hand parts for these locomotives, thus making these locomotives very economical to rebuild or just maintain. In result, despite the age of these particular locomotives, there are several of them still around. The F7 in particular was very much known for being rebuilt as a passenger engine, as an F9PH, or the more popular FP-10, equipped with a HEP power generator to power the new type coaches that were now heated and cooled with electricity instead of heated with steam generators and relying on axle bearing generators for electricity. With their ability to be rebuilt as these type locomotives, many of these units can still be found in service to this day. In fact, the former Amtrak units for the longest time have remained treasured possessions of the Morristown and Erie, where they last worked on the main eastern railroad, now a fallen flag. The two surviving Amtrak units have since been moved on to another tourist railroad in Connecticut. Bottom line, unlike its competitor Alco and its beautiful Alco PA, the EMDF units, due to their numerous numbers, are very much easier to find in service this day and enjoy. And they continue to delight fans of all ages to this day. And that's going to do it for this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If not, thumbs down. Please comment, like, and subscribe. And as always, keep the metal side down.